Morning all, I'd like to have a look at the game in round 11 between Anish Giri and Fabiano Carana. So uh, Giri 27-20, Fabiano 27-8-1. So round 11 you'd think exhaustion might start to creep into everyone's play. Uh, let's see what happens. So d4 from Anish, um, which apparently uh, was, was a bit un unusual for, for his previous encounters against Fabiano. Um, there was an interesting um, uh, commentary after the game uh, for this game if you want to check that out as well so um, he played d4 and after d5 we see uh, at the moment Queen's Gambit declined and now a Slav defence has emerged Knight c3 and it is actually offering a pawn here it can actually be taken in this position and it is taken. Uh, from a fundamental point of view, it is as though black has weakened dark squares here in the position. And so getting rid of this dark square bishop might be a good idea strategically. Uh, of course, being able to regain this pawn is also desirable. And this next move, a4, does help prevent b5. We see bishop b4, black celebrating that b4 square, which is weakened. And now g3. So why it's pretty calm about trying to get back this pawn. Sometimes bishop g2, knight e5 will hit the c4 pawn. We see knight f6 here, bishop g2. And black's a bit wary about uh, perhaps knight e5 here. And this next move, knight bd7, is played. Okay, um, now let's just actually check, instead of in this position, uh, knight e5 here, uh, there might actually be something like knight e4 for example, and then maybe even queen a5. So I think um, bishop g2 is also quite important to play here, not, not to play knight e5 immediately, but we'll check that out in the second pass actually. That's an interesting um, consideration perhaps. So knight bd7, and now both sides castle. And then we see queen c2, so white is, is not too bothered about being a pawn down at the moment. Black played now queen a5, which does mean potentially the queen can swing across to a seemingly dangerous square, actually, h5. Um, this next move puts that out of the question, though. Knight a2 hitting the bishop, the queen can't go anywhere at the moment. And um, okay, this bishop, where does it want to move back to? And this is an interesting question. Where would you move this dark square bishop back to? And as I mentioned, you know, black's putting pawns on light squares, so this is an important bishop for the dark squares uh, generally in black's position. And I just wonder if I gave you 10 seconds to the side, uh, where would you put your bishop? d6 or e7? Because that's an interesting, I think, discussion point here. So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, well the bishop was actually in the game put back to d6. Uh, now this, this might be quite interesting to consider that on, on d6, if white ever gets the c4 pawn, it will be attacking uh, the bishop on d6, potentially. Uh, but on the other hand, you might think, well, the bishop on d6 might help for e5 later, which is, is a desirable pawn break sometimes. Okay, so let's just bear those ideas in mind. We see queen takes c4. And now, okay, white's got the pawn back, but is actually sacrificing, in effect, a4, because there is a forcing move here to win a4, surely, knight b6. So white's temporarily going a pawn up just to lose it, sorry, restoring material just to lose it again, to be a pawn down again. So why has he done this? Queen c2, okay, the pawn is taken with the queen. White does gain a tempo now. B3 on the queen, 
And the queen, okay, it's slightly awkwardly placed, but again, can it try and go over here to h5 to be annoying? And then you might think, well, later knight d7 and e5, and maybe even this bishop coming out on, on exchanges, black's dreaming of liberating the position, liberating this bishop and playing for e5 later. The bishop here, though, at the moment is, is pointing at granite. So will queen h5 be permitted? Can white actually stop this queen h5? Because it can be quite annoying. You know, even crude things like knight g4 after could be annoying. So this next move is also quite interesting. It's knight e5, believe it or not. Even though that seems to be protected and covered by the queen, and one of the points maybe the bishop was to, to facilitate the queen coming across, white uh, is refusing to allow the queen to come across. And what would happen now if bishop takes e5? Well, if bishop takes e5, white doesn't want to lose a pawn. He plays here bishop d2. Where does the queen go? It looks awkward if it goes to b5 now, then knight c3. And white is getting a big position here, surely. You can take this and then maybe even play knight e4, hitting the queen. And look at the dark squares. White's got great compensation here. So with knight e5, white's actually again managed to prevent the queen coming to h5. Okay, so we see knight bd7. And now look, look at this, knight c4. So was this a blunder from black? Well, the thing is, in this position, the, the queen also cannot even return back. By gobbling that pawn, the queen's exit route back has been stopped as well. So knight, knight c4 is a bit of a pain if the knight moves, but what else? Um, you know, white is actually threatening as well, even if the knight... If the knight didn't move back, you know, bishop d2, where's the queen going? It's running out of squares. Queen b5, knight c3, protects e2 and hits the queen on b5. So where is this queen going? So knight b7 is not just about challenging e5 again, but giving the queen a route back. But in the process now, after knight c4, white's guaranteed some compensation here. White's getting that dark square bishop. With pawns on light squares, the, the dark square bishop was was an important guardian. So here it's, it's going after queen c7. Uh, the other option for, for white here, as well as taking the bishop, is of course to get space in the centre. But uh, this this is a solid position of advantage. Steinitz has talked about the bishop pair and uh, the first world champion, and it's important to get for white to get the bishop pair sometimes. But here the dark square bishop is an especially valuable asset. So we see knight takes d6. Queen takes d6. The thing is, you might not think, well, okay, we've got this position here, uh, a pawn down. So, why is this bishop pair any good? Why is this dark square bishop in particular? How is it actually going to prove it, prove itself, its value? Would it really be on the squares that are marked out earlier, these dark squares, or will it be something else? White plays rook d1, protecting the d pawn, and when these, we see this breakout e5. The thing is, the centre is becoming a little bit more open with this e5 potentially, uh, which might be good for the bishop pair. Okay, and if black wanted to sort of create a fortress on d5, it's, it's, it's less likely now. So we see knight c3 here, uh, offering another pawn to be two pawns up. Is this too good to be true? Why is white offering yet another pawn? Well, um, it is a dangerous position now because, for example, d5 could be blasting this bishop in scope to extend the scope, or d takes e is also nasty. And, and there's also, of course, bishop a3 on the cards here. Okay, so black played e takes d4, and we see bishop a3. So two pawns up, c5, and this extends the scope of this bishop. So potentially these are good bishops, but black is two pawns up. It's rather a dramatic scenario. Uh, so what happens here? Why, why, uh, why has white done this? Well, this next move starts to cast a little bit of doubt here on black's strategy. White plays e3 and is actually blasting open the centre a bit. 
Uh, the immediate threat is, well, ED and Rook D4, there's a pin there on the Queen as well. Black, in this position, decides to uh, give up the pawn here with D3. So it's looking a lot better for White now. Rook takes D3. White has this bishop pair still. Uh, but there's this question. Uh, the Queen goes back to B8. Uh, how does the dark square bishop prove itself? Okay, well, in this position, white plays now knight d5, which takes away a little bit the fence of black's king. This trying to get rid of one of the defenders is interesting. So we see knight takes d5. Um, potentially, it's it's dangerous to allow knight e7, and potentially uh, nasty things after that. As one example, so knight takes d5, rook takes d5, and we see b6. And here, okay, a pawn down with this bishop pair, and the bishop shut out of this diagonal. So surely the relevance of d6 and e7 is, is coming out of question. It's it's not that relevant. But what is relevant now is perhaps another dark square, bishop b2, and it's pointing at the king here. So white uh, has played this so far very dynamically, being very calm and casual about being one or two pawns down. And um, okay, so are there serious threats emerging here? Well, yes, there's a threat, for example, rook h5 on h7, rook g5 on g7, uh, potentially uh, bishop e4. Uh, so there are there are quite a few potential threats on the horizon. In this position, maybe. Um, also, bishop b7 is ruled out, rook d7. Maybe black wants a6 at some point. And he doesn't want to play knight f6, there's bishop f6. So all we can see, we can see it's quite an unpleasant position. And in fact, if the knight move, there's also bishop e5 on the queen. So these bishops are looking uh, remarkably good in this position right now. It's, uh, I hope you would agree that it looks as though there's good compensation for the pawn. So black plays a5, and actually this this is this is a really really nifty move. Now I wonder if you can spot it if I give you ten seconds, starting from now. So the key clue is g7. You want to sort of build up on g7. Um, it's a little bit of a trick question as well. How would you build up? effectively on g7 here. Okay. Uh, now if you if you said rook g5, yeah, give maybe give yourself one or two points. But if you said this next with rook a4, give yourself at least five points because this is bringing another piece yet into into the attack. So either g4 or h4. So it looks as though black's king's really getting precarious here. Uh, we see rook e8 and now rook g5 and that's a beautiful way of celebrating the dark square bishop. It didn't need to be about the dark squares here after all. King safety. This is a really really concrete frets now on g7. It's parried with g6 for the moment but now a great attacking move with more concrete frets. I wonder if you can spot it. I give you 10 seconds starting from now. By the way, it's not bishop takes a8. Don't you don't have to be greedy here, you want to go for the king. So what would you play here? Okay. Bishop d5. And now this pawn is pinned, so I think rook takes g6 looks very tasty, among other things. This looks like a, a very sad move to play in a very sad position, really. King f8. And now, what does white play? Um, maybe black's tempting some amazing sacrifice, but uh, do you play an amazing sacrifice, or what would you play here if you were white? 10 seconds here. This is the final move of the game played here.
Okay, Rook F4. End of the game. Black resigned. Fabiano Carano, 2781. Basically crushed. Uh, absolutely hopeless position. Uh, with it seems insurmountable difficulties visually anyway. And look at this diagonal. Um, we saw recently on this channel this Cabobank of brilliance in life on this diagonal. You think it wouldn't happen to a modern super GM to have such a, a terrible diagonal, but uh, this is the case here in this position. This is an absolutely terrible diagonal. If rookie seven, maybe even queen c3, uh, like in the Capablanca game, is very strong. It threatens mate. Let's have a quick look at this. This was Anish Giri's only win of the tournament, by the way, um, but a, an interesting win. <laughs> so the engine is recommending sacrificing the queen here. If we go with rook e7, then indeed queen c3, like in the Capablanca recent game we checked on this channel, is a crushing blow, it seems. How can black defend queen h8? If the king tries to run, it, it does look hopeless, but let's, let's follow this through. In this position, rook e5 now threatens, I guess, rook takes f7, because that's pinning the rook. And the queen and bishop coordinate on e5 here. So the threat is rook takes f7 or rook e7? Rook e7, rook f7. <clears throat> so there's nothing much here. In fact, this position is absolutely crunching. And now no defense, for example. OK, it's going to be a mate in four. So a bit of a brutal game. And and actually, on, on that, that quiz check on, on this, just get to this position first. This bishop d6 is fascinating how this can be considered perhaps uh, a small inaccuracy, bishop d6. Uh, and uh, OK, let's, let's, let's go back. Well, in, in, in retrospect, it can consider, be considered a small inaccuracy that the bishop was a target. Uh, so, did Black have to go and win that pawn? Let's find out. The A pawn, maybe, after was, was the big problem. So here, OK, Black took the pawn. Virginia actually doesn't mind White's position. Engines are getting more dynamic as well. So we see G3, and it's, it's just the cess that is about equal here. Uh, this this idea of knight e5 Im immediately, um, well here uh, as well, knight e5 probably doesn't work because of I guess queen queen d5, sorry knight f6 as well or knight e4. Let's let's find out knight e4. It's important to stop knight e4 here. And in fact, there's a remarkable tactic here with knight takes f2 as well, which is maybe something to bear in mind. That's painful so you can't you can't allow uh, knight e4 here so bishop g2 and, and that makes knight e4 far less effectual in fact it might not even work that well so queen c2 this position would be would be good I think would, would be okay for white so look back so bishop g2 and and it's here uh, that knight d7 stops knight e5 anyway both sides castled queen c2 queen a5 the queen not really encouraged to go to h5 with this next move, knight a2. And okay, from an engine point of view, uh, there's not much of a difference between bishop e7 and d6. I do wonder if the problems really stemmed later when white, um, when black rather gobbled this a pawn. Going back to e7 at this depth is uh, considered a tiny bit more accurate than bishop d6. So let's see this queen takes c4. Was this actually needed to play knight b6? The justification for the, for the bishop here perhaps should be tied up with e5. It does support e5. If e5 was played here instead of a game for this pawn, do we have a different game completely? In fact, out of interest, are we in uh, a reference database or completely out of it? We're, we're completely out of it. And when uh, oh, there's one game here, Ilian Sick against Blažević, so a 24:50 was playing black against the 2555 Ilian Sick in 1996 from this position. 
and I think so e5 was played in this position before in 1996 let's have a quick look at that game actually just to see how that went so ill in in it's sick that's low in a sick 2555 against the 2450 uh, so this Queen h5 happened this horribly crude looking dangerous attack which you kind of be afraid of especially in blitz games so f3 I suppose now queen g2 and bishop e3 for this diagonal. Or bishop b2, okay. So let's see just the basic pattern here. That white gained a little bit of space in the center. Play the well this this king's in danger has to step out. And uh okay. So in this position, White's uh, got some pressure emerging, threatening Rook B7 mate there. So so that that was with, with e, the Bishop D6 being used for E5, which uh, looks a lot looks quite scary for White actually. Um, how how this occurred? Um, so E5 here, allowing White to support. Uh, the a4 pawn with b3 and still playing knight b6 uh, but getting that queen to h5 so it seems um, white, white's got potential uh, advance in the center here though um, and he didn't mind about his Fianchetto bishop going let's just quickly see this again so yeah white had some sort of advantage there anyway let's let's go back to our main game so we see uh, in this in this position in, in our featured game here that um, Black went for the pawn immediately. Uh, was Fabiano thinking that game was a blunder? Maybe maybe he'd seen that previous game and thought it was a blunder. Why didn't Black just win a pawn? I have no idea really. Actually, it's positional. I mean, it does seem to be that um, the queen is is kind of stranded over here without an easy way of getting back, either to h5 or d8. Uh, that's the problem here after b3. That this next move proves it can't go back that easily. Uh, can't go to h5 that easily. Knight e5 is a very clever move, uh, making use. And and the engine actually likes this move a lot. I think, or does it? Knight e5 or e4. Also, e4 is liked as well. e4 does threaten e5, so putting queen h5 on on hold as well. And even this position has got good compensation, threatening mate there, kicking the queen. I mean, that's a ridiculous square a3. So, so white's okay here as well in this position, but with with knight e5. The queen stops as well from coming to h5. And white does claim an advantage as well. If bishop e5, let's just check this out. Bishop d2 is actually so very pleasant, I think. Knight c3, we take here as, as mentioned. Knight e4, and this, this is this is a pleasant position as well. Good compensation for the pawn. So in the game we saw after knight e5, knight bd7, and black losing that light square. Sorry, the dark square bishop. So. Uh, White's well, definitely got compensation for the pawn, but at this point, you wouldn't think um, this diagonal is, is going to play such a decisive role. With black opening up the center, is really removing this pawn, which means this diagonal is a lot more valuable to white for creating weaknesses, etc., for getting at black's king. So black playing for e5. If black doesn't play for e5, the problem is this this bishop's kind of hemmed in. Uh, this diagonal is good anyway, even if it's not going to be this diagonal. So it seems maybe strange that Black's going for e5 here, which which basically improves this bishop eventually along the diagonal. Okay, but so the question is, you know, let's see if Black doesn't play for e5, uh, what happens exactly? Let's have a quick look. Uh, so knight c3 a5. Let's just follow this through a little bit. White well, can play for e4 here, maybe aggressively. Uh, e4, yeah, let's go with e4. I like the look of e4, waiting for that to be a candidate. And, um, well, if black's having to play e5 here, we've got the diagonal opening in any case. Uh, even worse, 
in fact white can even use d6 here so th this is this is nice for white as well this kind of position the the dark squares are vulnerable uh the diagonal's open anyway okay black's liberate the bishop on the bright side but white might have a plan now like this for example uh, or even just using the c5 square so okay uh black decided that it was it was okay for e5 in circumstances and we get now this this is quite ingenious uh, really, it has to be said, uh, what we witness here, that white is committing to another pawn sacrifice now, uh, to be two pawns down uh, with this move, uh, which engine likes to be two pawns down here. After bishop a3, slight advantage to white, no big deal. Okay, and um, maybe Okay, at this depth it seems Queen E5 was the lesser evil, just giving up the exchange. If we give up the exchange, we have got the two pawns for it. I think White's still okay, Knight E4, and I think actually Anish had had, had convinced himself that this uh, was okay for White as well. This exchange, um, being the exchange up, was okay. I think he mentioned weakened pawns over here with Knight C5 being a possibility. He actually went through. Uh, I think you might have mentioned a line like this with the exchange sack in the uh, in the analysis video, which he, he he did some analysis on this game himself. So, um, and he said he really liked this sort of position. And one thing he was keen not to do was not to block in this bishop by playing e4 at any point. So this this bishop's got a nice striking diagonal as well as this one. So it's it's a very aesthetic game. I I, I feel uh, this. Two, two pawns down situation but with the black center very very fragile now and giving having to give back a pawn and we're left with this this trump has been more emphasized this diagonal bishop on diagonal is is really hugely emphasized very very quickly getting rid of blacks uh, the fence around the king quite rapidly and provoking a, an irreparable weakness now when, once g6 is played it's very very unfortunate uh, this position now, g6, without dark square bishop, is just asking for it. It's, it's end of game. It's starting spell end of game. White's well, threatening, I think, rook g6, clearly, because of that pin. What else can black do here? Uh, it's a pretty pretty dire position. If he plays knight e5, I think it's only delaying things. Uh, let's have a look. <clears throat> bishop takes. Oh, I could take a rook here, free rook. Yeah. So um, it's it's pretty hopeless here. Uh, it was nifty how I thought it was nifty how this rook was brought in the uh, the attack using uh, that kind of poison pawn that White took. White's a pawn is actually a way for the white rook to get in to attack the king as well, as it turns out. Okay, uh, so round about here, Black uh, resigned. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that game. It's it's uh, it's an advanced kind of dynamic game in the Catalan, really. How you can be one or two pawns down even sometimes if you've got the bishop pair, you can really cause damage. Get this positional compensation, which goes well beyond calculation. It's it's really um, showing how positional elements can can really reap havoc around king safety as well. It can be interconnected with king safety issues having the dark square bishop. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.